Okay, well, we might uh, uh, get uh, going. Uh, absolute pleasure uh, for myself on behalf of uh, David Wang um, to uh, welcome you along to a seminar today by uh, Mary Ann Anderson. So, uh, Mary Ann's uh, been doing a PhD uh, with uh, David and myself uh, just under three years now, and this is uh, also in partnership with the uh, Department of Medicine. Uh, of the university uh, over at uh, Royal, Royal Melbourne Hospital. Um, Mary Ann's a, a, a medical graduate, um, a, na a native of Melbourne, and uh, started a PhD before she'd finished her specialist training in haematology. Um, she's managed to complete her specialist training in haematology while she's been doing a, a PhD. Um, and today she's going to be talking about uh, some of the studies that she's been leading on ABT199 in the clinic and with a special emphasis on translational uh, elements. I'll leave for her to tell you the story. Uh, suffice to say, though, that no one in the world has more experience with treating people with this new drug than, than her, and uh, she has some novel insights into its application, which I hope uh, that you'll find uh, very interesting. Thanks, Mary. Thanks, Andrew. So um, my name is Mary Ann. Today I'm going to be talking to you about the work I've been doing over the last three years, uh, looking at targeting BCL2 in the treatment of uh, the diseases that we treat as haematologists, leukaemia and lymphoma. So just so that everybody is on the same page, uh, leukaemia is a cancer that starts in the blood forming tissues, such as the bone marrow, and causes large numbers of blood cells to be produced. These enter the bloodstream and can cause clinical problems. Lymphoma is a general term uh, to describe malignancies that develop in the lymphoid system, and there are greater than 60 subtypes of lymphoma. Collectively, these diseases are known as lymphoproliferative disorders. So, we have here a graph uh, which is Victorian data between 2006 and 2011, and it shows some of the more common malignancies. And uh, in blue, we have the cases uh, per person diagnosed per year, and in red, we have the deaths per person. And what I'd like to point out is that most people with leukaemia still die of their disease, and nearly a third of patients with lymphoma die of their disease. And although these figures are much better now than they were a decade or two decades ago, we still have a long way to, to go, particularly when these diseases become relapsed or refractory. So chronic lymphocytic leukaemia is the disease which I'm going to be focusing on most uh, today in this talk. So it's probably worth uh, just taking a few minutes uh, to talk about what this disease is. It's actually the most common adult leukaemia, with an incidence of two to four per 100,000. It's characterized by a proliferation of small mature lymphocytes in the peripheral blood bone marrow, and other lymphoid organs. These lymphocytes are easy to distinguish because they express aberrant CD5 and CD19. And CLL uh, is an interesting disease from our point of view because it uniformly overexpresses BCL2. And because of this uh, overexpression of BCL2, the CLL cells uh, accumulate in vivo because of inappropriate survival. CLL predominantly affects people beyond the sixth decade of life. However, it's important to point out that it can affect people from 20 years. It often has an indolent clinical course. However, there's a subgroup of patients in whom the prognosis is really poor. So this is an aged matched population along here in black. And this is overall survival after diagnosis. Here we have 50% uh, of the patients alive, and here we have years. If you look um, at, at the particular uh, genetic subgroups that we're interested in, so deletion 17p or deletion 11q, you can see that the survival, the median survival is between four and six years. Other poor prognostic factors in this disease include uh, advanced age, as well as uh, poor responses to first line therapies. So there's a clinical need in about 25% of patients with poor prognosis disease for new therapies that are gonna work in the disease. Um, especially once they become uh, resistant to standard therapies. So um, apoptosis and BCL2 are topics that everyone in this audience will be very familiar with. But it's worthwhile just taking a few minutes to recap. 
So we know that normal cells undergo death via apoptosis when stressed, and that a hallmark of cancer is the development of ways to avoid apoptosis in stress situations. <laughs> Failure of apoptosis promotes cancer formation and underpins resistance to chemotherapy and radiotherapy. BCL2 is an intracellular protein that blocks apoptosis and is overexpressed in many hematological malignancies. So when a cell is at rest and it's quite happy, BCL2 is keeping the cells alive, blocking apoptosis. When we apply chemotherapy uh, to a patient's cancer cells, the pro-apoptotic BH3-only proteins are, unle uh, are uh, activated, these bind to and inhibit BCL2 and unleash uh, apoptosis. BH3 mimetics are small molecules that mimic the function of BH3-only proteins. BH3-only proteins selectively antagonise the pro-survival BCL2 family. So we have here, uh, for instance, oh dear, for instance, BIM, which binds to all members of the family, whereas BAD binds BCL2, XL, and W. So by targeting various members of the BCL2-only family, BH3 mimetic drugs can achieve selective clinical effects. So the first of these drugs was ABT737, which binds BCL2, XL, and W. However, ABT737 was not suitable as, a, as an oral agent and so did not go on to clinical trials. ABT263, which in clinical trials was known as Nevitaclax, like ABT737, binds to BCL2, XL, and W. Um, and it, this is available as an oral uh, tablet for patients to take. Uh, phase one studies led uh, by Andrew at the Royal Melbourne Next Door have shown a 35% response rate as a single agent in relapsed and refractory CLL. And uh, this is an example of a patient after seven cycles of therapy where bulky abdominal disease has really just melted away. However, the problem with nevitaclax was dose-limiting thrombocytopenia. And in mice, Carly Mason and others at this institute have shown that this is due to a BCL-XL effect. So just to illustrate, um, this is a, a graph of platelet count in patients uh, versus uh, the time of dosing, so as intermittent doses of ABT263 or as continuous dosing. And here is um, 150 uh, times 10 to the 9 per litre, and this is uh, the, the, the lower end of the normal range. Down here is uh, 25 times 10 to the 9 per litre, which is what we consider to be a clinically significant uh, threshold, where patients can start to develop problems with bruising and bleeding. And you see that uh, with both dosing regimes, the platelet count uh, falls and remains uh, low when the drug is applied to the patients. As a result of this, um, we were never really able to give uh, higher doses of ABT263 uh, uh, because of the safety concerns with the platelets. So there was a need for a drug that doesn't target BCL-XL, and ABT199 was developed. This has selective inhibition of BCL2 uh, with significantly less binding affinity for XL and W. So there's a potential for being able to give much higher doses of the drug without the thrombocytopenia. And we would hope that this would result in better clinical response rates, remembering that ABT263 was associated with a 35% response rate. And so a phase one clinical trial uh, is underway, and that was uh, really carried out in conjunction with my work here. So we hypothesise that specific inhibition of BCL2 will induce apoptosis of CLL and result in clinical responses. And we tested this preclinically and as part of the first in human phase one clinical trial of ABT199 in patients with relapsed and refractory B cell lymphoproliferative disorders. The specific aims of the work that I'm going to talk to you about today are as follows. One, to determine the activity of ABT199 in vitro and in vivo against human B-cell lymphoproliferative disorders. Two, to assess whether there is efficacy in chemorefractory patients with deletion 17P, so that really high-risk subgroup that we spoke about. Three, to assess whether the ongoing in vivo dosing with ABT199 is associated with increased in vitro resistance. And four, to look for potential hemopoietic toxicities of ABT199. So with respect to the first aim, what's the activity of this drug in vivo and in vitro against B-cell lymphoproliferative disorders? 
So I think it's worth taking time to consider how a drug, in the, a molecule in the laboratory becomes a drug that we use in people. And the first step is preclinical studies. And many of the people in this room will be familiar with preclinical studies. So this is work generated at AbbVie. Um, and this is basically a tumour volume in uh, a mouse a xenograft model of um, acute lymphoblastic leukaemia, RS411. Uh, in black, we see uh, the tumour volume when mice are treated with vehicle as compared to tumour volume when ABT199 at 100 milligrams per kilogram is used. Tumour volume is much less with ABT199. Similarly, when ABT199 is given to dogs and Nevitaclax is given to dogs, for a similar levels of exposure uh, to the drug, there's a much greater fall in the dog's platelet count with Nevitaclax compared to ABT199. So, what happens in human disease? And I think it's worthwhile just taking a moment to think about how we did a lot of these experiments. So we took peripheral blood and bone marrow from patients who were in screening for ABT199, and then at various time points throughout the study. We used density gradient separation with FICOL to, to isolate the mononuclear cells. Uh, we titrated these against various dilutions of ABT199, and we isolated the uh, CLL cells. So these are PI negative alive, CD19, CD5 co-expressing cells. And we used that information from the facts to generate a dose response curve. Along here, we have the percentage of viable cells, and along here, we have the dose of ABT199. And this enables you to generate an IC50, or a half maximal inhibitory concentration, which we use as a measure of the, cell, of the drug's potency against the cells. So Siong uh, Lim Kaur in our lab uh, first did these experiments uh, just before I started. And the first thing that was immediately apparent is that ABT199 is really quite toxic in vitro to CLL cells with uh, very sensitive dose response curves like this. I've subsequently built on Siong's early work and we've looked at more than 48 patients now. And the median IC50 is 1.8 nanomolar. And this is a, the kind of concentration that would be easily achievable in humans. Similarly, we can see that BCL2 selective inhibition uh, is at least as effective as BCL, as combined uh, BCLXL and BCLW uh, inhibition. So uh, when we look at ABT263 compared to ABT199. And when we compare 263, 737, and 199, their sensitivity to, to um, CLL sensitivity to all three drugs is not significantly different. Similarly, we can see that ABT199 kills these cells very rapidly in vitro. So there's a significant amount of cell death seen even at four hours, with almost 100% cell death seen at eight and 24 hours. So ABT199 is killing CLL in vitro. What's it doing to platelets? And this is work done by Carly Mason, um, which shows that pl human platelets ex vivo are significantly more sensitive to nevitoclax in vitro than they are to, C to ABT199. So ABT199 is killing CLL in vitro while sparing the platelets. Is it killing via apoptosis? We know that BCL2 maintains mitochondrial membrane integrity and prevents activation of BACs and BAC, maintaining CLL viability. So we used the JC1 assay. And in the JC1 assay, in a healthy cell, the JC1 is concentrated in the mitochondria where it emits red fluorescence. When the mitochondrial membrane is disrupted during apoptosis, for instance, induced by ABT199, we, JC1 diffuses into the cytosol, where it emits green instead of red fluorescence. And in fact, uh, compare, when we uh, use this assay, you see in, when CLL is incubated with DMSO for 24 hours, uh, the cells are emitting red fluorescence. In contrast, when they're incubated with ABT199, they're emitting green fluorescence, consistent with the hypothesis that ABT199 is inducing mitochondrial depolarization. So if ABT199 is killing cells via apoptosis, we know that caspase activation is a critical component of that. So when we add a, a caspase inhibitor, we would expect cell death to be uh, prevented. And in fact, that's exactly what we see with the pan-caspase inhibitor QVD. So to summarise the preclinical data, ABT199 is killing CLL cells in vitro rapidly and efficiently at low concentrations within 24 hours of exposure. 
ABT199 is not inferior to ABT263 or 737 in inducing CLL death. And it achieves this by, doing, uh, by inducing apoptosis. Simil final, finally, thrombocytopenia is not predicted to be a dose limiting based on these pre this preclinical data. So what happens in the patient? So going back to that question we asked at the very beginning, how does a drug in the how does a molecule in the lab become a drug that we use in people? So we've gone through all the preclinical work and now we're ready to move into clinical trials. And there are clinical trials are broadly classified in three phases. So phase one clinical trials, and just bear in mind that that is what the rest of is what the work I'll be presenting to you today is done in conjunction with. These are typically first in human studies with usually less than 100 patients. The aim is to define the safety profile and appropriate dosing regimes in humans. And pharmacokinetic data as well as biological signal data is an important component of these studies. Phase two studies are larger, often with hundreds of patients, um, and these are preliminary efficacy studies. Phase three trials, however, are, ra are registration trials with hundreds to thousands of patients. They're often randomised comparisons with standards of care. So, patients are enrolled in cohorts, they're started on small doses, and then these doses are gradually increased until limited by side effects. The primary purpose of these studies is to determine safety, determine the appropriate dosing regime, collect information on biosignals, and collect information on pharmacokinetics. And what's needed? So you need the right drug. And we think from the preclinical information I've shown you that ABT199 is the right drug. You need the right disease. CLL has shown um, responsiveness to an earlier form of these drugs, and it's also a drug in which we know BCL2 is very important. It's also a disease in which we know BCL2 is very important. You also need the right patients. So who were the patients that we put on these studies? So these patients needed to have disease that required treatment. They had to have be relapsed or refractory after standard therapies. They had to be reasonably well with adequate kidney and uh, liver and heart function. And they had to have adequate bone marrow reserves. The exclusion uh, criteria, so patients could not come onto the study if they'd had a prior transplant or active infection. And the, the study was designed that patients would take tablets once a day f indefinitely. So uh, this is a summary of the patients who we have put on the study, and these are the first 56 patients. And this data was presented at IWCLL earlier this year. The things that I'd like to point out from this uh, particular slide are that the patients were often multiply relapsed. Some patients had had up to 10 lines of prior therapy, and the median number of prior therapies was four. Additionally, two thirds of the patients had seen our best current available therapy for CLL, which is fludarabine. And a third of the patients were actually refractory to fludarabine. Many of the patients, in fact, more than 50%, had what we would define as bulky nodal disease, with greater than five centimetres of lymph nodes uh, present. And this is actually the first patient that was ever given this drug um, back in June 2011. And at screening, this patient had approximately half a football of lymph nodes sitting um, in between his liver and spleen. So furthermore, these patients were in the very high risk, very high risk genetic group. So 38% were deletion 17P and 10% and were 11Q deleted. And I just want to emphasise how important deletion 17P is in this disease. So this is overall survival after our best available chemotherapy regime, which is fludarabine, cyclophosphamide and rituximab. And here we're seeing 50% survival. And this is the deletion 17P group. And you can see that at two years, 50% of the patients are dead. And they're all dead by four years. So this is a bad disease. So um, Andrew and I gave the first patient this drug um, in June 2011, and subsequently uh, Peter McCallum just down the road gave the next two patients in the world this drug. These, patient, these three patients received either 200 or 100 milligrams as a single oral dose. And what we saw immediately was a rapid reduction in the lymphocytes. So this is the lymphocyte count. In the two patients who had an elevated lymphocyte count, it was up between 30 and 40. Within eight hours, the lymphocyte count was down in the normal range in both of the patients. Similarly, there was a rapid reduction in palpable lymphadenopathy. And the other thing that we noticed immediately when we gave this drug was that all patients had a very sharp and dramatic rise in their lactate dehydrogenase, or LDH. 
LDH is a marker of tumour breakdown. And um, the rise in LDH, in addition to the rest of the biochemistry, defined these patients as having tumor what we call tumour lysis syndrome. Tumor lysis syndrome describes the metabolic derangements that occur when tumor cells break down following cytotoxic therapy. And we define it based on a criteria called the Cairo Bishop criteria, which require for laboratory tumor lysis syndrome a rise in uric acid, potassium, and phosphorus with a fall in calcium. And clinical tumor lysis syndrome is uh, characterized by a rise in the creatinine, sudden cardiac arrhythmias or death, and seizures. Tumor lysis syndrome, unfortunately, is the most significant toxicity seen to date with this drug. And there have been two deaths in the US and one acute renal failure. So in the year since these three very serious adverse events occurred, um, there have been significant changes in the protocols that we use to treat the, drug, the, the patients with. So um, there's very slow es dose escalation. So we're starting patients now at a dose of as low as 10 milligrams of ABT199 in contrast to the 200 milligrams that we used with the first patient. And we use uric acid lowering agents as well as inpatient monitoring of biochemistry. So it's not all bad news because actually tumor lysis syndrome is, um, is an, a measure of a drug that's working very, very effectively, in fact, too effectively. So we can see here, this is the patient whose CT I showed you earlier with a half a football in his abdomen. Within six weeks, this had again melted right away. Similarly, in 79% in of patients had a normalization in their lymphocyte count within six weeks of taking this drug. So this is a waterfall plot. And what we see here, this is zero, and this is the defined as the amount, the area of lymph nodes that are measured at screening. And then we measure the, the, C, the, the lymph nodes via CT scanning um, at periods during, the, during treatment with the drug. When you see the bars going up, that means the lymph nodes have increased. And when you see the bars going down, that means the lymph nodes have decreased. And this is 50% reduction. And that's a clinically important threshold that defines a partial response. And you can see that the vast majority of patients have had a partial response, and almost all of them have had some reduction in their lymph node bulk. So to summarise uh, the, the clinical data that we have to date, among these first 56 patients, there's an 84% overall response rate. And please bear in mind that these are the patients who are the worst of the worst. They're relapsed, they're refractory, they're high risk. Every, they tick every high risk category. And yet we're still seeing a response rate where we have 20% complete responses and 64% partial responses. In terms of um, adverse events, in addition to tumor lysis syndrome, approximately 41, well, 41% 41 of patients also had neutropenia. And I'll talk more about neutropenia later in the talk. So ABT199 is killing CLL in vivo as well. Is this via apoptosis? So this is um, looking at some experiments that we did taking CLL cells from patients after the first dose of ABT199. And we look for exp um, expression of phosphatidylserine on the cell surface. And you can see that pre-dose, there's very little phosphatidylserine uh, in this patient, whereas post-dose, there's a lot of phosphatidylserine, suggesting that the cells are undergoing apoptosis. This hasn't been a consistent finding, and we can only, we've only really been able to demonstrate this in about 50% of the patients that we've tested. And we think this is probably because um, since those first few patients, we've actually uh, started dosing with very, very low doses of ABT199, and to the point where we're actually not seeing falls in the lymphocyte count early on. Similarly, uh, cells that express or are extruding uh, phosphatidylserine are often rapidly uh, cleared by the immune system. So to summarise the clinical data, in relapsed and refractory patients, ABT199 results in rapid CLL death with an overall response rate of 84%. Increased phosphatidylserine uh, exposure on the CLL cells after a, the first oral dose of ABT199 would be consistent with um, induction of apoptosis. And tumor lysis syndrome has been the most serious toxicity associated with the drug to date but can be ameliorated with strict adherence to prophylactic protocols. So what happens in other B cell disorders? This is mantle cell lymphoma. Mantle cell lymphoma is an aggressive non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. It's characterized by CD5 and 19 co-expression, 
Um, and the lymphocytes overexpress cyclin D1 due to the translocation 1114. And most mantle cell lymphomas have moderate to high BCL2 expression. So um, in work done by AbbVie uh, in the preclinical studies, uh, Granata cell line, which is a mantle cell lymphoma cell line, were transplanted into mice, and then tumour volume was measured. When ABT199 or vehicle alone are used, the tumour volume increases, as, as shown here. When, um, and this is more than when the standard of care therapy, which is bendamustine rituximab, is used, so here. But again, we see even more tumour uh, bulk production when bendamustine rituximab, so standard of care, is added to ABT199. So there was a suggestion in the preclinical data that um, ABT199 may have uh, a role in other non-Hodgkin's lymphomas. So I've tested three patients in the laboratory, um, so I've been able to look at their mantle cell lymphoma cells. And the median IC50 from these three patients is three nanomolar. So again, in the similar range to, the AB, uh, to ABT199 uh, with a, a CLL. And this is uh, one of our patients who we treated. And at baseline, she had a seven centimetre lymph node at the base of her neck. After six weeks of treatment, she was in complete remission. So absolutely no lymphadenopathy left to, to find on CT or clinically. So comparing um, some non-Hodgkin's lymphomas that I've had a chance to test in the laboratory to CLL, you can see the mantle cell lymphoma has a very similar sensitivity in the lab to CLL. And the response rate clinically to mantle cell lymphoma is actually 100% and 84% in CLL. However, the story is not so rosy with other forms of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, such as follicular lymphoma, which has a median IC50 of 45 nanomolar, so quite a lot higher than 3 or 1.1, or marginal zone lymphoma in which the um, IC50 is 145 nanomolar. Similarly, the clinical response rate in follicular lymphoma is 27%, and the one patient uh, who went on study with marginal zone lymphoma didn't respond at all. And this is surprising because follicular lymphoma in particular um, overexpresses BCL2 as a result of the 1418 translocation. So just to have a look at the waterfall plots for the non-Hodgkin's lymphoma patients, and um, I'll just draw your attention to WM. So that stands for Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia, which is another form of uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. What I'd like to point out on this plot is really that the really great, really deep responses that we're seeing are, tend to be with the ma mantle cell lymphomas and the Waldenstrom's, whereas the patients who tend to be relatively refractory or actually progress through the, the study drug tend to have diffuse large B-cell lymphoma or follicular lymphoma. So, to summarise the first part of my talk, ABT199 kills CLL and some non-Hodgkin's lymphomas rapidly and potently, both in vitro and in vivo. CLL can be in CLL, we can demonstrate that this is due to induction of apoptosis in vivo and in vitro. And the most significant toxicity found to date with this drug is tumor lysis syndrome, which uh, has been, we can mitigate with uh, appropriate prophylaxis and monitoring. So that brings us to AIM2. So, so ABT199 is working in CLL. But what about the group of patients who are at very high risk and who do very badly in CLL, the 17P deleted patients? And it's worth saying that 17P uh, contains the P53 gene. So patient, we think that the poor prognosis in this group of patients is due to loss of P53. So when we apply cytotoxic stress to cells, we activate the P53 pathway. And therefore, we would predict that uh, deletion 17P or TP53 mutations uh, would be powerful predictors of both chemorefractoriness and poor prognosis. And that is, in fact, what we see. So this is a survival curve. Of, so patients surviving after our best standard of care, FCR. And the 50% survival rate um, is much lower when there's a TP53 mutation compared to the patients with no TP53 mutation. So BH3 mimetics theoretically bypass P53. And we hypothesised that ABT199 would not be associated with an inferior outcome in patients with TP53 dysfunction, unlike the, state, the, the, the case with conventional uh, chemoimmunotherapy. 
So we evaluated um, patients treated with ABT199 at the Royal Melbourne and also at Peter McCallum uh, at screening for TP53 dysfunction using a variety of techniques. And the ones I'm going to talk to you about today were FISH for 17P deletion and TP53 high resolution melt and sequencing. And we correlated the TP53 status with in vitro and in vivo responses. So considering this cohort of 34 patients, 33% of the patients were deleted 17P by FISH, and 52% had TP53 mutations by sequencing. And we divided the patients into three groups, those in whom we could detect no TP53 mutation and no deletion 17P, those in which we could detect both TP53 mutation and deletion 17P, and those with either a TP53 mutation or a deletion 17P. And we compared uh, the response in vitro to ABT199 based on the category of, seven, of uh, P53 dysfunction. And what I'd like to point out is that all three groups appeared to be similarly sensitive to ABT199 in vitro. What about clinically? So these are the three groups again, so no deletion 17P or no TP53, both or one. And you can see that actually the response rate in all three groups is at least 87.5%. So these patients are sensitive in the laboratory and also uh, in the clinic to ABT199, irrespective of their TP53 status. So we know that patients who have TP53 dysfunction don't do well with our best, our best therapy, which is FCR. But the data that I've shown you suggests that they may do equally as well as other patients with CLL uh, to novel agents such as ABT199. So it would be useful to be able to predict which patients, how much uh, TP53 dysfunction is present in an individual patient so that we can help to predict whether they're likely to do well with our standard therapy or whether perhaps they'd be better off with a novel agent. So in a CLL cells of um, any patient, the proportion of cells in which there's a deleterious TP53 mutation or deletion 17P can vary between 0 and 100%. In CLL, TP53 function is heterogeneous between patients and also within an individual. And knowing the overall function of TP53 in a patient's CLL may help to predict which patients will respond to standard therapies. So what we'd like is a functional assay for TP53. And last week in this forum, Liz spoke to us about the Nutalin assay, which is Nutalin is a, um, an MDM2 antagonist. So cell death is induced in the presence of P53. And we asked the question whether P53 can be used as a functional measure, sorry, whether Nutalin 3A can be used as a functional measure of TP53 in CLL. So considering two patients, uh, in the red, pa the, the patient is uh, deleted 17P, and in the blue, there's no 17P deletion. Uh, when exposed to Nutalin for 48 hours, the patient with 17P deletion has a um, significant amount of cell death at the higher doses, whereas the patient without 17P, sorry, with the, with the 17P deletion is very insensitive to Nutalin. However, both patients are almost equally sensitive to ABT199. And when we consider, again, these three uh, categories of uh, TP53 dysfunction, so those with no TP53 mutation or deletion 17P, those with one or the other, and those with both, you can see that um, the patients without either TP53 mutation or deletion 17P are more sensitive to Nutalin than the patients in whom TP53 is both mutated and deleted. But when you look at all three groups, they're similarly sensitive to ABT199. So to summarise the second aim, CLL from patients with TP53 dysfunction appears to be equally sensitive in vitro and in vivo to ABT199. In contrast to responses seen with standard fludarabine-based therapies, where the outcome is worse if TP53 dysfunction is present. The Nutalin 3A assay may be useful in predicting the overall function, functional status of TP53 in an individual CLL and may assist in predicting response to fludarabine. So moving on to our third aim. The question we wanted to ask here was whether there um, is development of resistance both in vitro and in vivo when, patients are when CLL is exposed to ABT199. So considering uh, the patients from RMH who were treated for greater than six months on study, 
Five out of 14 eventually cease study drug because of progressive disease. Now, um, in all five of these patients, uh, the reason for progressive disease was a rictus transformation, either histologically or clinically. Um, and in one patient who was on the rituximab combination study, uh, this one patient also had progressive disease, and in this patient it was also due to a rictus transformation. What's a rictus transformation? So on this side of the picture, and this isn't one of our patients, but on this side of the picture we have small mature lymphocytes, characteristic of CLL. On this side of the biopsy, we have large immature lymphocytes, characteristic of a um, diffuse large B cell lymphoma. And when CLL uh, develops into a more aggressive lymphoma, the term we use is a rictus transformation. And we know that 90 to 100% of um, these rictus transformed cells are clonally related to CLL. So we hypothesise that ABT199 treatment in vivo is selecting for outgrowth of, outgrowth of clones that are resistant to the drug. And we tested CLL from patients with progressive disease ex vivo for sensitivity to ABT199, and we were fortunate enough to have paired samples at study entry. And what we saw was two patterns. So in one pattern, the patients with progressive disease also had decreased sensitivity in vitro to ABT199. In the second pattern, sensitivity in vitro to ABT199 was maintained, in contrast to the in vivo behaviour. So to illustrate, this is uh, what I've called pattern one. So in red, we have it screening, the sensitivity to 199. In blue, the sensitivity at two months. And um, in black, the sensitivity at five months. So the sensitivity is decreased along with increasing in vivo resistance. In contrast, over here, this individual, um, we see their cells, their sensitivity at screening in red compared to a progressive disease, which is uh, more than a year after starting treatment. This individual, really, the cells are similarly sensitive. It's important to note that this assay was somewhat limited because um, after in vivo treatment, there was often very few cells left for us to actually test. So again, we looked at um, the, C the sensitivity of CLL and Richter cells to ABT199. And here we have five patients, uh, all of whom had a rictus transformation. And we had looked at their sensitivity of the baseline CLL to ABT199, the sensitivity of what CLL we could find um, at the time of progressive disease, and also the sensitivity of the rictus transformed cells. And in all but, so in four out of five patients, you can see that the rictus transformed cells um, and the CLL cells of progressive disease were significantly uh, less sensitive to ABT199 in the laboratory. So um, I think it's illustrative just to, to show you what we're dealing with, to just uh, have a chat about one of our patients who had a rictus transformation. And this was a 75-year-old man with CLL diagnosed in 2009 that was refractory to our best available therapy, FCR. At screening, uh, he had bulky abdominal disease, a heavily infiltrated bone marrow, and was not 17p deleted. He received 300 milligrams of ABT199 daily and received only two, two doses of the scheduled um, rituximab because it was complicated by um, a condition called hemophagocytosis. And his best response to um, ABT199 was actually not very good. It was only um, stable disease. So he didn't, his disease, CLL didn't grow, but also didn't get smaller. Um, after six months on study, there was a progressive uh, increase in a lymph node in his groin, and a PET was consistent with high-grade lymphoma. A biopsy uh, went on to show a rictus transformation with still a uh, very high expression of BCL2 and patchy expression of, um, or pa patchy overexpression of P53. Um, and a bone marrow biopsy performed at the time did show some reduction in the CLL present. And this um, individual uh, also showed increased, increasing resistance to ABT199 over the course of his uh, treatment on the drug uh, to the point where at the time of progressive disease when he was taken off drug, the rictus transformed cells were almost completely insensitive to ABT199, despite having high levels of BCL2. So to summarise our third aim, in a subset of patients with CLL treated with ABT199, the disease initially responds but then progresses. And we see two patterns of in vivo resistance. One, one in which in vitro resistance can also be demonstrated, and this is likely due to an emergence of resistant clones. 
However, in the second pattern of uh, resistance, it appears that um, in vitro resistance does not is not seen. And so you could postulate that this is perhaps due to a protective effect of the microenvironmental niche. The other important uh, thing to say is that Richter's transformation appears to be a common mechanism of progression uh, in these patients on ABT199. And uh, genomic analysis of paired samples is actually is, is planned. So uh, fourth and final aim was really to look at the potential hemopoietic toxicities of ABT199. So we've already shown you preclinical data that would not predict thrombocytopenia uh, in response to ABT199. And in five out of the 56 patients uh, whose data I've presented to you today, uh, or 11%, uh, thrombocytopenia was seen. I'd like to emphasize that thrombocytopenia is a common complication of CLL. No matter what treatment you give them, and even if you don't treat them, patients with CLL often have thrombocytopenia. It's important to say also that the thrombocytopenia seen in this group of patients did not appear to be dose-related. Um, and in all of the patients, the thrombocytopenia was actually present prior to starting on the drug. Um, this group of patients includes those in whom uh, the thrombocytopenia could clearly be shown to be immune-mediated in its, in its uh, nature. And immune-mediated thrombocytopenia is a well-recognized uh, complication of CLL. In one patient, uh, the thrombocytopenia occurred in the setting of tumor lysis syndrome, and in another patient in the setting of progressive disease. So we don't think that um, you can blame ABT199 for these, these six cases of thrombocytopenia. What happens to the white cells? So we did a series of experiments where we took normal human uh, peripheral blood, so normal human donors, we took peripheral blood samples. We used uh, density gradient separation to isolate the mononuclear uh, layer. And then we titrated the mononuclear cells with different dilutions of ABT199. And we looked at uh, survival of CD19 B cells, CD8 T cells, CD4 T cells, and granular sites and um, looked at the IC50 of each of these cell types. And what we saw very uh, strikingly was that CD19 positive B cells have a very similar sensitivity in vitro to ABT199 as CLL. However, the CD4 and 8 T cells appear to be relatively resistant to ABT199. And the granulocytes present in the peripheral blood appeared to be almost entirely resistant to ABT199. So, we would predict, therefore, that patients treated with ABT199 would develop lymphopenia but have relatively normal neutrophil counts. So considering our cohort of patients, um, 13 out of 18 of our CLL patients developed lymphopenia, and 6 out of 7 of our non-Hodgkin lymphoma patients developed lymphopenia. However, we also saw an unexpected mild to moderate neutropenia in many patients. 14 out of 18 CLL patients, of which five actually required the use of GCSF, and six out of seven non-Hodgkin lymphoma patients, of whom none required the use of GCSF. And there's ongoing work by Carly Mason and others um, to try and address the reason uh, for uh, the neutropenia. And I guess the question is whether, because the data I've shown you wouldn't suggest that it's due to um, a toxic effect on the circulating cells, so whether it's at the progenitor or stem cell level that the drug is uh, causing this neutropenia. So this is, again, one of our patients. And you can see that at screening, this individual had a very heavily heavy infiltrate of small mature lymphocytes in their bone marrow. After six months of treatment, and it doesn't project particularly well, but what um, I'd like to point out is that this patient actually doesn't have CLL in their bone marrow. And in addition, the bone marrow is significantly hypocellular. So the patient's marrow has been cleared of CLL, but it's also been cleared of the, the normal progenitor cells as well. So to summarize uh, the fourth aim, as predicted theoretically and in preclinical studies, thrombocytopenia does not appear to be associated with ABT199 therapy. Patients receiving ABT199 develop an on-target lymphopenia. And the neutropenia observed in clinical trials is unexpected and cannot be explained by a direct toxic effect on circulating neutrophils. So to conclude, I think, I hope that what um, I've shown you today from the in vivo and in vitro data uh, constitute absolute validation of BCL2 as a therapeutic target in human cancer. 
Um, ABT199 shows significant activity in patients with relapse and refractory CLL with an 84 response rate in the worst of the worst patients. There's evidence for ABT199 both in vitro and in vivo with other B cell lymphoproliferative disorders, most um, potently mantle cell lymphoma, but also Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. ABT199 activity appears to be independent of deletion 17P or TP53 mutation, both in vitro and in vivo. And ongoing, there's ongoing work needed to try and address the reasons why patients eventually develop progressive disease and more worryingly Richter's transformation while on treatment with this drug. And I think clearly this drug, um, ABT199, really deserves further evaluation in um, BCL2 overexpressing lymphoid cancers, both as a single agent um, and in combination, and work is uh, in train to do that, although we haven't had time to speak about it at length today. Um, it remains for me to thank um, many, many people who made this work possible. Um, most particularly, I'd like to thank uh, the patients and the families who are brave enough to go on to a first in human study, but also um, the two numerous to name colleagues here at the Wee High, uh, including my supervisors, Andrew and David, but Kathy Kulechi, who did so much of the um, FICOL uh, density gradient separation for me, which is a huge amount of work. Um, and the postdocs in our lab, as well as uh, research nurses and colleagues at the Royal Melbourne and Peter Mack. Um, and I'd just like to particularly thank Lisa McGee, Mary Moody and Megan Smith, who, uh, without whom none of the clinical work would have been possible. Uh, the referring doctors, co-investigators on the M12-175 phase one trial, uh, our colleagues at Genetech and AbbVie, and also uh, our funding agencies. Thanks. Thank you very much, Marian. We left us plenty of time for questions. Questions for Marian? Anna and then Jerry. So, so you've got at the moment no idea why the cells that have undergone the Richter's transformation are not responsible, why they escape. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess one of the things that I should make clear is that Richter's transformation is something that's well recognised in CLL. It happens in about 5% of patients. And it tends to happen in patients who are high risk, so the 17p deleted fludarabine refractory, patients who've had disease for a long period of time. So there's a question of whether it's selection bias, so these are the patients who would develop it anyway, or whether there's some element of the drug that's driving it. And we don't know, and I think that's why the genomic analysis with the paired samples is going to be really interesting. But uh, yeah, we don't have, we haven't done that yet. Jerry, a very elegant talk. I wanted to, as you indicated, perhaps your most surprising observation is the failure to see impressive effects on follicular pharma, where we mm. know these two is finally expressed, and we were almost taking it for granted that it would work. Yeah. Uh, what are your ideas about that? It's interesting because um, just I think it's worthwhile just going back to the the flow plot, the waterfall plot. Yeah. So what you'll see here is that there are actually a subgroup of follicular lymphomas. So some follicular lymphomas actually do respond to the drug very well, but others do not. So it's heterogeneous, yeah. and I think that it would be really interesting to take samples from the patients who respond and compare them to the patients who don't respond and find out what's different. But at this stage, you know, presumably there's something else going on in the ones that don't respond because they all overexpress BCL2. So there's obviously some other survival pathway at work. But what it is at this stage, I don't know. So I was interested in the way you got around the tumor lysis issue, and that was by yeah. reducing dose initially. Yeah. Do you think that runs a risk then of perhaps having larger numbers, selecting, selecting for resistance because you've given the tumour cells longer to accumulate the changes necessary. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. Is there a way of testing that? Um, look, you know, in an animal yeah. model or xenograph? Yeah, I mean, so as you say, it's exactly how in a, labor in a laboratory setting you do a resistance type experiment. You start at low doses and right. gradually build up. Um, 
Clinically, we haven't really seen a, a reduction in, in um, sensitivity at the six-week mark. So normally what we do is we dose escalate for five weeks now, starting low, going really, really slow and increasing the doses. And then at the six-week mark, we take cells, the CLL cells, and we test them in the laboratory. And again, um, so these experiments can be a bit tricky because often, particularly if the, if the patients responded very well, there are very few CLL cells circulating. But the ones that we have looked at, it seems to be some of them are less sensitive and some of them are more sensitive. In terms of um, not seeing, seeing res significant resistance induced by this, actually the vast majority of our patients respond. So it doesn't seem to be a clinical issue. Um, but, you know, I guess we, you know, on... There may be, I guess, looking at the patients who do have, say, stable disease, for instance, they would be the interesting ones to look at and see if perhaps the reason they haven't responded as well is because they did develop resistance over time. I suppose one interesting question that we've been debating is whether the Richter cells were actually pre-existing, given the speed in which it's come down in some patients, or whether they've arisen as a result of selective pressure by the drug. So there are potentially a number of different mechanisms. Mm. That, that'd be interesting. Susan? Um, lovely talk, Mary Ellen. Um, very exciting study. <coughs> um, <coughs> going back to these resistant follicular lymphomas, and in fact, any of the tumors that are mm. resistant, um, one of the predictions would be that they happen to be tumors that have got increased expression of, say, in particular, MCL1, mm. um, or any of the other yeah. pro survival proteins. That are related to BCL2. So um, my question is whether or not you've yet had a chance yeah. to look at the profiles yeah. of expression. We, we have sample ready to go, and uh, I have not as yet had a chance to look at that. But that's uh, again one of the things in the pipeline. Uh, so what's the strategy for determining, or how do you go about combination studies? Now, yeah. Obviously, yeah. Now, obviously, you know I know that. But how do you choose or how do you go about choosing which conventional chemotherapy agent to combine? Yeah, so I think it depends on the disease. So in CLL, I mean, you know, it's obviously very early days, but if I had CLL, I'd probably want ABT199 as a single agent. It works really well and really effectively. If I had follicular lymphoma, I would want my ABT199, if I was going to get it, combined with standard of care treatments to see if that's the group of patients who pay. So, you know, you get a, you'll have an X response rate with RCHOP, for instance, uh, and you'll have an X response rate with ABT199. The question is, does ABT199 combined with that conventional chemotherapy improve the outcome, for, particularly for this group? So the strategy is just to add it into yeah. the Yeah, so the, I, there's a study coming along uh, with bendamustine, rituximab, and ABT199 in the larger cell lymphomas. So it will be to, I think, add on to current treatments. I mean, interestingly, so there are some other very exciting drugs for CLL coming out, things like abrutinib, and you know, I'm not aware of any studies combining the two, but that would also be very interesting. Alex? <coughs> um, I was wondering if some of the preclinical work using ABT737 showed that uh, some of the killing was BIM dependent. I wonder if you have any insights off from your use of ABT199, yeah. either with relevance to the mantle cell lymphoma patients, given that. <laughs> Yeah, look, I haven't looked at BIM at all in my work, um, but yeah, it's an interesting question that could be addressed. Claire? Um, in terms of the neutropenia, were all those patients pre treated with yeah. DNA damaging? Precisely. So um, two thirds of those patients had received fludarabine before. And fludarabine, um, as you know, causes is very nasty to the bone marrow. However, what we did notice was that patients would often start out with a neutrophil count that was low, but not very low, and then it would subsequently drop. So whether that's because these patients have just no reserve and anything tips them over the edge into significant neutropenia or, or not, is, it's hard to say, but it is a complicating factor in these studies. So none of these, so these patients are de novo, so diffuse large B cell lymphoma can arrive de novo, so in the setting, in a patient who has no other um, hematological malignancy, or it can arise from a, a lower grade lymphoma such as CLL. 
These patients are de novo diffuse large B cell lymphoma. These are not Richter's transformed patients. So it seems that the ones that respond to best seem to be responding. Yeah, um, I think uh, to me, what I take from this is really the ones that respond best are the sensitive ones, such as mast cell. Um, you know, and I, I certainly currently we're actually dose escalating much higher than this in the follicular lymphomas, where we're giving people now 1,200 milligrams to see if we can increase the rate of response. John, so the, the results looked extremely encouraging. From a general perspective, uh, forward perspective, when does it stop being a trial and when does it start? What do you need to do more? Yeah, so um, I know that they're trying to fast track this drug because it is so exciting, but it does need to go. So these phase one studies really are only designed to answer the question, is it safe? So these are phase one? Yeah, this is all phase one Sorry. person human data. Um, so all of the efficacy data I've shown you is basically a secondary endpoint. Um, but this is phase one data designed to ask questions that say we need to go into phase two studies um, and then hopefully you know, pass the registration process. But I wouldn't have thought it would be available much before 2017 in the clinic. Andreas? So, were you surprised about the very good response of several patients with the Spalden sperms, macroglobulinemia? Because I thought that this is like a plasma cell type of related disease which is thought to be mostly MCL1 dependent rather than, than BCL2 dependent. Yeah, look, I haven't actually had a chance to get my hands on any Waldenstrom cells myself. Um, and so I don't actually know what the sensitivity in the laboratory is for, for uh, Waldenstrom cells to ABP199. Um, but, you know, clinically it certainly seems to be one of the diseases that warrants more investigation because it is responding so so well clinically. <coughs> I mean, we are using ADT199 now in multiple myeloma, so um, it's being used in combination with the standard of care agent um, ortezomib, and we have a trial running at North Melbourne of that. So it does seem that um, in plasma cell dysphagias there may be some efficacy for ADT199. Um, but Waldenstrom's, I mean, you know, at least morphologically, often the cells are small, mature sort of lymphocytes, similar to CLL, just on that level. But yeah, I mean, I think we need to do more work on Wolverstrom because I don't understand the, the reasons why it's responding so 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 exquisitely sensitively. I think last question to Guillaume. Oh, I'll give you a hand. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was wondering if you were pretty keen, and hopefully, the, the next phases will be as positive, but that would replace uh, the current therapies, or would you keep ABT199 only for the higher risk patients? Okay, so um, if it was me and I could have whatever I wanted and I had 17p deleted CLL, I'd want this drug. If I had standard risk CLL today, I'd probably go for tried and true therapy. FCR is pretty good. Um, and we know what the long-term consequences are, whereas we've only been using ABT199 since June 2011. So there are a lot more, I think, question marks over its long-term results. Yeah, well, I'm sure that that's in the pipeline. I'm sure people want to do that. But I mean, clearly with the phase one studies, you have to restrict it for people who have no other options. <coughs> Marianne, thank you very much for one.